morning, Mount Zion Church family. My name is Princess and I am honored to welcome you to our online church service on this Sunday morning. If you are new or this is your first time, we welcome you and we are so glad that you chose to worship with us here at Mount Zion Church of Ontario. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to our channel below. And as we continue with our worship service, we uh, also encourage you to use our chat function so that you can connect together. Thank you so much for joining us here at Mount Zion Church of Ontario online service. again to our online services here at Mount Zion Church of Ontario where we are located in beautiful sunny Southern California let's let's start our time off in prayer father God thank you for these precious moments to bow down and worship before you thank you for how you always show up in our lives and do something special to reassure us that you are God father God come today asking that you will take our time today and use it to challenge us use it to encourage us and chip away at us and cause us to leave our worship experience better than when we started get the glory O oh God in all that we say and do in the name of Jesus amen 
But I certainly want to thank one of the hosts of our podcast, She Reflects. Thank you for welcoming us, welcoming us, Princess. God bless you. She Reflects is a podcast where our ladies chop it up and they talk about a lot of relevant issues for women, such as dating and sex. Uh, they talk about mental health, self-care, colorism, and a lot of other issues. So ladies, thank you for keeping it real on She Reflex. Today, I want to talk to you about narrative alignment. Narrative alignment. Your narrative is your life story. Your narrative is your beliefs and your behaviors that make up your life. Your narrative tells the story of what you think, what you believe, what you say, and what you do. Your narrative is your story of doing life. Doing life has us traveling on many roads. Some roads take us on a journey of a very short life. Other roads take us on a journey for a very long life. Some roads lead us to the tops of the mountains of success and some into the valleys of defeat. Some roads are smooth and some roads are rough. Some roads are paved with inherited resources and some roads are paved with the dirt of hard labor and, and sacrifice. Some roads have plenty of joy and excitement and some roads have loneliness and pain. Some roads have slow speeds and some roads have high speed. Some roads are maintained very well and some roads are poorly maintained. On every road you travel in life, you can run into hazards such as the potholes that shake your faith. On every road you travel, you can run into a tragedy that causes you to skid out of control. You can have a hard bump, hit a hard bump that breaks your heart and, and shakes you up and reduces your energy and causes you to lose your vision. You can run into a bump that causes stress. You can experience failure that blows up years of progress. You can invite the wrong people and things into your life that will fog your vision and cause you to crash because you did not see them as a hazard until it was too late. These road hazards in life affect your narrative. They affect your story. They can knock your story out of alignment and knock your life out of alignment, which affects your story. And when your story is out of alignment, you can end up being constantly pulled in extreme directions in life be pulled into the onto the wrong side of life when you hit a hard bump or curb in your car your front end gets out of alignment you damage your suspension knocking some of the highly calibrated components off kilter making your wheels set in properly on the road in other words your car will will pull to the right or pull to the left or your steering wheel will shake. If you don't get your wheels aligned, you will cause your car to veer into other lanes and you can have an accident. You will cause damage to your tires and end up having to buy, buy tires sooner than you want. You can actually damage your suspension system. You can increase your fuel cost because your tires begin to wear unevenly. When your car is pulling to the left or to the right, you must stop and take time off your job. You must delay your vacation or miss out on something else to turn your car over to your trusted auto mechanic who with great skill and the right equipment will straighten your wheels. They will put your wheels straight so that your vehicle will travel straight and true. Somebody listening to me today needs your narrative aligned. You hit a life hazard and, and you've become bitter and you've become rude. You're callous and insensitive. You don't care like you used to care. 
you used to be very thoughtful and, and always look for ways to bring joy into your husband's life. But now you just don't care anymore. Your emotional connection is gone. Zero. Man, that last bump while doing life is pulling you to some extreme places in life. Instead of facing your problem and working through it, you found it easier to escape by drinking and using mood-altering substances. Now, after a few months, you need something stronger. And so, in addition to drinking and doing drugs, you're escaping by telling your wife that you're going to work and you're slipping off to the strip club or you are sneaking off to a hotel with another woman. You don't mean to hurt your wife and your children and, and other family members and friends, but, but you won't stop and you won't get your life aligned. You, you, you keep pulling to some of the greatest extremes in your life. Your narrative is off kilter. Your life is off balance and you need to stop and get a realignment for your narrative. Pastor, my situation is not that extreme, but I do get your point. I need my narrative realigned. I can see myself and feel myself being pulled away from God. I just don't have the same zeal for God like I used to have. Pastor, this COVID-19 stuff is hard for me. I'm having a hard time staying connected on visual platforms. I need to physically see my people. I need to set in a physical worship experience. I need, I need to set, I need to physically set in a small group and discuss principles from the word of God. Oh, pastor on top of COVID is my anger and pain behind the racial injustices and, and the racially motivated violence in the country today. And it's been, it's been sparked again by police killing and, and excessive force uh, examples by police in our country. I appreciate our San Bernardino County Sheriff John McMahon who has repeatedly said there are police officers out there with bad hearts and because their hearts are bad, they're doing bad thing to bad things to people and we need to identify them and we need to get rid of them. He said those kind of police officers do not deserve to be police officers. Sheriff, Sheriff McMahon is right, but you're also right in talking about your hurt and your pain, it's real. Pastor, racism seems to be getting worse. Racism and discrimination can be seen in people and in institutions all over the country. And I'm hurt and I am angry about it. I see a lot of window dressing in programs and meetings and on and on, but I don't see enough change inside of people's hearts that's going to bring lasting change and healing in our nation. Pastor, racism is one of the demonic strongholds in America, and it's toxic, and the toxins are seeping into my life. Pastor, on top of COVID and racism, I have my own issues. I'm just not connected like I used to be. I need a narrative realignment. Well, let God realign your narrative. Let God do that. Let God align your narrative. Let him change your life. Let him put your life back on track. It's not about you comparing your life to someone else's life and feeling like you're not as bad as somebody else. It's about you coming before God and allowing God to realign your life with his word and his will and his ways for your good and for his glory. This is the thought for you to remember today. 
Let God realign your narrative. Let God realign your narrative. Let God point your wheels straight on the road so that your travel in life is straight and true. God has a six-step alignment process in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is the book of the comparisons. It is the wisdom book that provides principles for living according to the law of God. God's six-step alignment process is found in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. The Christian Standard Study Bible insightfully notes that the odd number verses contain commands and the even number verses contain the promise from God if we obey his commands. King Solomon, the, the, the son of King David, was the young man who, who received uh, unsurpassed wisdom from God, unsurpassed wealth from God, and, and God used King Solomon to write these Proverbs. And here we have in these 12 verses, in chapter 3 of Proverbs, God's alignment process. God lays out a deliberate and logical order for how he aligns your narrative and my narrative. God starts with his word and then he works on necessary parts of, of our lives so that when we come out of this process, God has our wheels, our life straight on the road so that we travel straight and true. Here's what you have to do. You have to stop and bring yourself before God for an alignment. You have to stop what you're doing. You need to slow down. Bring yourself before God for his alignment in your life. Guess what you have to do first? <laughs> you have to set your heart and your mind to a to hear and obey God's word. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. The Proverbs hone in on this young man who was Solomon's protege. He was teaching this young man, and, 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 and we gained from this. In fact, in chapter 1, Solomon talks about how the Proverbs were designed to help young people be successful, to be able to take knowledge and, and understanding and be successful in every aspect of life. The Proverbs that give us this, this process that is unreal. You first have to set your heart, your mind and your heart to obey God's word. <laughs> you, you can't just Think about it when you go to church. You can't just think about it when you have a Bible study. This, the, the writer of the Proverbs, Solomon says, through God, you don't forget my words. You can't forget the word of God. It has to be on your heart and in your mind. The fact of the matter is you, you can't forget it and that's why it's on your mind in your heart. You can't forget it. Oh, okay, all right. Here, here's what God is after. This is what God is after. God wants you to take your mind and your heart and establish his word as the final authority for your faith and practice. God's word becomes the authority for what you believe, what you think, what you say, and what you do. This is not a nicety in life. This is the establishment of God's word as the authority in your life. <laughs> By setting your heart to obey God's word, you're making what God says your ultimate source of information, your ultimate source of truth. No exceptions. Your politics, 
and your cultural beliefs and practices are no exception. God's word still must be the authority in every area, including your politics and your cultural beliefs. For God, there is no when in Rome, do as the Romans do. That doesn't exist with God. With God, there is no what, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. That, that's null and void for God. For God, wherever you are, his word is your authority and should shape how you think, how you speak, and how you act. Oh, pastor, I, I, I do a lot of research and I listen to the ideas of others and, and I learn from other disciplines and I just mix them all together. And that's, that's how I get my truth. I use Google search and, and I do all of this stuff and, and that's how I get my truth. You can learn and you can listen to other people. You can hear other people's opinion. You can study the other disciplines. God, God gives truth to scientists and God gives truth to business leaders. God doesn't have a problem with truth because he's the source of truth. What God wants from you, God wants you to make his word your primary source for truth. Not the culture, not your friends, not Google search or any other source. He wants to be the final source for your life. Well, pastor, this is, this is too restrictive. And it confines me to only one ultimate truth. God does not say you can't gain from other people in wisdom. Please don't misunderstand what God is saying here. God does know the wickedness of human hearts. And God knows that people can do studies because they're trying to prove a hidden agenda. God knows the heart. What God wants you to understand is he is going to tell you the truth about every situation in his word. He does not glamorize humans. He shows us who we really are. He shows us our condition and he shows us what we can be through our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to choose his word as our ultimate source of truth. Well, what will God do, pastor? What will God do? If we establish, if we set our mind and our heart on the word of God as our ultimate source of truth. Well, look at Proverbs chapter three, verse two, for length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. The, the word of God, the commands of God will add to your days, days that are meaningful, days that are full, days that provide Peace, shalom, peace, this shalom, this Hebrew word has to do with wholeness. It has to do with a meaningful balance in all aspects of our lives. So if you will take God's word and, and set your heart and your mind to obey it, you'll have wholeness. You have balance all the days that you live in life. All right, all right, all right. Despite the pushback that you have, the, the little reservation you have for making the word of God your ultimate truth, and despite your friends pushing back, and despite the culture pushing back, and your professors in the universities pushing back, and, and, and different organizations pushing back, you make, you set your heart and mind to make God's word the authority for you. All right, you do that. What comes next? Well, look at the next verse. You have to be kind and truthful. Look at Proverbs chapter three, verse three. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. <laughs> so having the Bible as your final authority does not make you a Bible thumper. It does not make you some extremist where you have to constantly tell people the word of God says this, the word of God says this, the word of God says this, and you have to walk around on the edge always in some outer way and some 
creative way, telling people their life is not lining up with the word of God, but yours is. Oh, God takes this thing to a much higher level. When you get in God's process for an alignment, he fixes your life so your wheels in life are straight. God commands you and he commands me to be kind and truthful. God demands that we have integrity. God commands us to be consistent in our behavior toward other people. We're to be nice to people and, and we're to be reliable. We're to be consistent. We are to be firm and faithful. We're to, to let kindness and truth be our way of life, binding them around our neck and writing them on the tablet of our hearts describes what's coming out of our hearts. You are kind and truthful first on the inside, in your heart, and then being kind and truthful, being reliable, being consistent toward others will come naturally for you. You're not strained when it comes down to being kind and truthful. I don't, I don't know about you, but, but I have very little patience for nice, nasty Christians. I have issues with them making cutting remarks with a smile. Why are you going to cut me down and play like you care about me? Making fun of others who have challenges. I have a problem with that. Making yourself look good at the expense of others, but playing like you really care about them. God says that's not kind and that's not true. God said, no, your wills in life are out of align, alignment. You are going in the wrong direction. Your car is off track. God said, be nice and be kind. Be nice to people. Be nice to that public school teacher and yet truthful when your kindergarten son comes home asking, mom, am I a boy or a girl? My teacher said, that I might be a girl, even though I was born a boy. You go down to that school and don't you cuss that teacher out. You be kind to that teacher and you talk to that teacher. You be truthful to that teacher. Let that teacher know he or she is not allowed to tamper with your, that teacher is not allowed to input confusion into your child's gender identity. You know, that's the curriculum here in California's updated sexual education framework. That's, that's what's being taught in our public schools here in California. If the teacher chooses to teach it, that's what is being suggested in kindergarten, that we tell our little kindergarten children that even though you're born a girl, you might be a boy. You get close to that teacher and find out when he or she is teaching on this new sex education curriculum and you opt out, you get your child out of that. And if the teacher tries to slip it in, you teach your child to say, teacher, I'm uncomfortable. I'm offended. Can I go call my mother? I need to leave class. My mommy doesn't want me to see this. You teach your child how to speak up and not allow that confusion to be input into their hearts and into their minds. You tell the teacher that you will teach your child about their, his gender identity or her gender identity based on the word of God. And you're not going to teach your child according to the California Board of Education. Be kind about that. Be loving, but also be truthful. Be very firm. Be very consistent. You keep up with that teacher. Find out what that teacher is doing. And when you do that, when you're kind and when you're true, not a hidden agenda, not being mean, that teacher, that transgender teacher, will respect your wishes and how you choose to parent your child. You want that teacher to teach your child reading, writing, and arithmetic and not tamper with their gender identity. It's not their business. It's not their job. 
My wife Hilda should not wake up in bed each morning wondering if I'm going to wake up angry and evil and, and if I'm unpredictable. She shouldn't be sleeping with Mr. Hyde or Mr. Jekyll. She needs to know that I'm going to be the same man who promised her at that altar that I will love and cherish her in prosperity and in adversity, in sickness and in health, in joy and in sorrow till death do us part. She needs to know that. God says, don't let kindness and truth leave you. When my heart is right and I'm kind and true, what does God promise? Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. I don't know about you, but I thrive when I have God's favor upon my life. I love for God to smile upon me. I want God's favor. And I also want to have God's wisdom. I want people to understand that I'm getting wisdom from God. And God says, if you will be kind and true, he will make sure he will smile upon you. He will open doors for you. He'll do unique things for you. He'll move traffic. So I tell people all the time when I get to these busy hospitals, God always gives me a part because I ask him, God will give you favor in so many areas in life, every area. And people will see that God's wisdom is upon you, is in you, and, and, and people will, will respect you for the godly wisdom that they see. You're not aligned yet. Pastor, that's a lot. That's only two steps in the process. God is just getting started aligning your life according to his word, his will, and his way. You have to stay in the process. The next part of the process is completely trusting God. Completely trusting God. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. So, verse 5 talks about taking all of your hope, all of your confidence, and placing that in the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, the God who loves his children, the God who loves righteousness, the God who has little tolerance for foolery and foolishness, the God who will spank us, the God who will have mercy on us, the God who will give us his grace, he's the covenant-keeping God. We are to put all of our trust, all of our confidence in the Lord. And God does not want a superficial trust where you just use words. God, I trust you. God, I trust you. God wants more than words. God wants this from your heart from your inner being, from that central processing unit inside of you, the emotions, the seat of emotions, that very part of you that makes up your immaterial life, that part that people can't see. It fleshes, like, it fleshes out like this. So the other day in working on this message, I lost three pages of summarized research with all, <laughs> with all of the resource, the citations. I had all, the, everything was there. It's gone. I don't know how I lost it, but I lost it. I was disappointed and I was bummed out for a few hours. Then I realized that I was preaching on my life passage, I realized that I needed to trust the Lord, put my complete hope and confidence in God. God never makes mistakes. God allowed that information to be lost 
because he was working on something in my life. My hope can't be in my intellectual abilities or my experiences in life. God said, you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I can't lean on my own understanding. Now I'm going to tell you what's hard about that. My first reaction is to do what I'm used to doing. My first reaction is to go for what I know. And that's common for all of us. And what God wants us to do is before we go for what we know and go on, I got this itis thing, God wants us to stop and acknowledge him. God said, hold up. I know you think you have this, but you really don't. Your life is out of alignment. Your narrative needs some adjustment. You need to stop and talk to me. The reward for trusting God with all of your heart and not leaning on your own understanding, the reward for that is wrapped up in a command plus the reward. <laughs> it says this, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. You have to stop and seek God's wisdom and he will direct your path. He will make sure your wheels are straight on the ground and you are traveling straight and true. Even when you think you got it, it's just so routine for you. God wants you to stop and acknowledge him. I don't know how many times I thought I could handle something that was routine. And I just went into it based on what I know and messed it up. And then there are so many times when I would stop and just say, Lord, give me wisdom, guide me, help me to wait on you and, 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 and lead this meeting in a way that's pleasing to you. There's so many times if I would have moved out on my own, I would have put my foot in my mouth. I would have made a mistake. I would have led this church in the wrong direction. I've often taken offense to Christians following a line of questions that, that actually demonize the church and, 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 and undermines the word of God. I would burst into the conversation with objections and <laughs> I wouldn't even hear them out. And, 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 and this is because I thought that I was handling their, what I, what I consider disrespectful questions in a way that was pleasing to God. And, and the more I did that, I discovered that I left more tension in the relationship, then I left conversation and understanding and kindness and truthfulness. Then I realized I had to remember my life scripture. God said, you, you know, you can't forget God's word, right? You got to remember it and you have to set your mind and your heart to obey it, right? And so in this passage, it says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. And so instead of me jumping on the person asking these, what I consider disrespectful questions, I, I started listening to the questions and, 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 and the line of reason, the line of questioning, it goes like this. Have you ever considered how restrictive traditional religious institutions are and how they've oppressed families and communities and inhibits creativity and openness to new things. Have you ever considered how that uh, works? Have you ever thought about how your established traditions are harmful to people, harmful to people's progress? Have you ever considered that? The questions automatically suggest that the, that the church that I value so deeply and the word of God that I value so deeply are suddenly invalid because some people point out the faults of some misguided Christians throughout the years. 
when I ask the Lord for his wisdom, I clearly see that the questions are designed to undermine all of God's word. Those questions are de designed to demonize the church so that these groups behind the questions can establish themselves as the source of authority, not God and not the Bible. I see clearly that even though all Christians throughout human history could have done good and, and we could have perfectly obeyed God's word, these people would still ask the same questions because they're not interested in the word of God being the final authority. And they definitely don't want the church to be held up as the ultimate organization in life. I see that the negative questions are never balanced. They, they never mention the good that Christians have done over 2,000 plus years. They never mention the orphanages, the feeding of the hungry, and they never talk about how we've built libraries and universities and hospitals around the world, how we've built water wells and how we've saved just millions of children's lives just by giving them clean water. They never mention our work during disasters. When we had 9-11, we were there. When we had the tsunami, we were there. When we had the wildfires, we were there with our disaster relief trailers and our people. They never mention that. They don't mention how Christians who followed the Bible confronted other Christians who twisted the Bible to keep people enslaved and oppressed. They don't talk about how Christians led the abolition of slavery in this country and in Great Britain. They don't talk about how Christians led the civil rights movement in this country and how we continue to fight for what's right in this country. <laughs> they never talk about how we've led community redevelopment and by building buildings and talking to people about showing respect for their community and discipling people and turning difficult communities around, such as in Chicago, such as in Chula, Mississippi, where we work. Don't talk about that. As I listen to the questions designed to undermine God's will and demonize the church, I realize I, 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 I realize what's going on. And so I asked the person, with the questions, questions to answer the question. I ask them, well, okay, if, if the church is no good and if God's word is invalid and too restrictive, what is your source of authority? Where do you get your authority from? <laughs> Who's giving you advice? Where do you get your information if God's word is not valid and the church is, is demonic and and bad for society. When they say research and, and studies, I simply respond, you mean people, people like you who did research and people like you, people who are no different from you who've done research and studies. Now they've established organizations and, and they put a label on their organization and they, they set forth standards and and, and policies, and now they are the established truth, and that's who you're following now? People ripped, ripped the church that you love apart. They ripped the Bible apart, and now they're your source of truth? In this life, we travel on roads that have plenty of hazards, and we need, we need the Lord to help us navigate us each step of the way. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. God will point the wheels in your life straight so that your narrative is straight and true. Well, we've looked at the first three steps in God's process, God's narrative alignment process. You're only halfway through. We'll talk about the other three steps next week. Here's your challenge for this week. Stop what you're doing and take yourself to God 
for a realignment. You've been pulled away. You're not as nice as you used to be. Your emotional connection is not there. There are things that are a little bit off kilter. You've hit a bump in the road or hit a curve or something has happened in your life and you need a realignment. Just stop and go to God and put yourself in the process. Don't, don't change the order. Don't get caught up. Well, I think I should do this or I think I should be kind and true for it. Why don't you just focus on the process as God has laid it out in chapter three, you trying to change the order is symptomatic of you being in control of your life and you need to leave it alone and let God have control over your life. Just follow the process as it's laid out. Deal with the word of God. Will you come under the authority of God's word? You say yes. Okay, now God says, I want you to work on being kind and true. <laughs> and then God says, I want you to work on trusting me with everything you have. Don't lean on to your own understanding. Check with me before you step out there. Those are the first three parts of the process. We'll work on the rest next week. So that's your challenge. Submit yourself to the process. When you're done submitting yourself to the process, you will notice some things. You'll come out of it different. Your attitude will be different. You'll handle things differently. Your wills will be straight on the ground. And your narrative will be back on track. For your good and for God's glory. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, with all the confusion, tragedy, trauma, and drama in life, I thank you for a clear process that keeps my life narrative aligned with you. Lord, when the hazards in life knock me off kilter, pull me in for a realignment so I don't drift away from you. Keep my mind and my heart set to obey your word. Help me to be kind and truthful and to completely trust you. Lord, protect me from returning to self-centeredness, but respect your process. Help me honor you with my finances and embrace your discipline for my wrongdoing. Lord, I submit myself afresh to your alignment of my life narrative. I live to love and serve you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, allowing God to have that kind of control over your life requires a relationship with God. You don't just walk off the streets and give somebody control over your life without a relationship. And that's what God wants. He wants to have a relationship with you. He created you. He wired you. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. And the one who created you wants to be in a loving relationship with you. And as you go through life, he wants to align you according to his will, his way, and his word so that your life is full and meaningful. I know it seems like doing this other stuff is so fun. And, and, and you, you like, I, I don't know if I'm going to, am I going to miss out on all the fun if I give my heart to Jesus? And, you know, am I? Don't worry about all that. There's plenty of fun walking with Jesus. We have so much fun as Christians. The first step, though, you got to try him for yourself. He will clean you up, get your mind clear, get your heart clear, and then you can live a meaningful life. And if you want that today, I would like for you to repeat this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I know I'm messed up. I have sin in my life, and I need you, and I want you. Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. I believe you were buried. I believe you rose again from the dead. Come into my life and save me. Make me the person you want me to be. Amen. If you prayed this prayer for the first time, welcome 
to the family. You can call the prayer line on the screen and, and let us know that you've prayed the prayer and we'll follow up with you. Or you can go on our website and you can join uh, Mount Zion on our website right there on the front page. I'd like to close our time today with prayer. Father, thank you. What a great privilege to know you and to have a process that keeps our lives meaningful, that causes us to go deeper in our love relationship with you. It doesn't get stale. It doesn't get old. We don't get bored because you have an endless level of love for us and we can experience that. We can go deeper and deeper and deeper each day. Oh God, I ask that you'll remember those who are struggling with COVID-19 and those who've lost family members and that, uh, that horrible, horrible virus. And Lord, I ask that you'll give our leaders wisdom and as we continue to deal with the spikes across our nation. And God, remember our, our frontline people all over the country. Give them supernatural protection. I ask that you will deal with our hearts and change us as Christians, Lord, so that you will hear from heaven and you will forgive our sin and, and you'll heal our land. Lord, we know you're speaking to us through COVID and we want to hear you and listen. Father God, remember those who are dealing with other illnesses, dealing with death and dying from other causes. And God, remember the prisoners and ex-prisoners and their families and God, remember the sick and confined, the, the homeless and the hungry and the helpless and the hopeless. Oh, God, the widow and the orphan. Lift up those who are struggling with marital issues. Some are trying to divorce and the other one doesn't want to divorce. God, I ask that you will cause them to look to you. Get an alignment and get right with you and be true to their marriage vows and do what's right before you. I ask, Lord, that you remember those who are single and looking for a meaningful relationship. Oh, God, bless them with that right person in the right time. I ask that you'll remember our president, touch his mind and his heart, deal with our other political leaders, help them to do what's right on behalf of this nation. Remember those who are in business and those who, we're working hard every day, our retirees as well. We're standing on their shoulders. Remember our seniors who really want to be at church, but they know that it's risky to get out. Just comfort them and encourage them. God, I certainly remember our missionaries all over the world and brighten our light as a church so that our, our desire to spread the gospel intensifies. Use us for your glory. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let the church say, Amen. Hello everyone and welcome back to Postscripts. Thank you again, Dad, for joining us. It was a great mm -hmm. message. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it made it reminded me that I uh, might need to get my car aligned. Um, <laughs> but yes, let's get into these questions. Okay. So the first one is you began by talking about how we all kind of run into hazards and on the road of life that we travel. Um, so how can we kind of recognize what these hazards are that can kind of take us off track? Excellent, excellent. Well, in the passage today, 
God says, acknowledge me in all your ways, and I'll direct your paths. So God can actually direct us around the hazards, but we got to take time to ask him for his direction. Okay. Got you. Okay. And with that, um, you also talked about how sometimes when we hit a hazard, we can be like bitter or rude or like in turn insensitive and how, so you kind of answered it a little bit by asking for direction, but how do we kind of catch it early before we start alienating people and people are like, you're acting different. Right. How do we right. catch it early? Okay. Well, the, this, the, the second part of the process says, do not let kindness and truth depart from you. And it says, bind it around your heart, around your neck, and write it on the tablet of your heart, kindness and truth. And so God wants you to be kind innately. I mean, just from the inside out. And that will help you. That will really help you if you just learn to be a kind person. And where you're truthful, where you're reliable, you're consistent. You're not hide and Jekyll, but you're always Leela. Yeah. You know, no matter what happens, you're Leela. And Leela's just a kind person. Yes, yeah. that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and then on a little bit of a different note, um, you kind of talked about how um, sometimes people can go around and constantly telling people, like, this is what God's Word says, and they're like, some people are like, oh, no, they're like too much of a Christian or something like that, and I feel like sometimes we know those people, but we don't know how to go about telling them, like, I get it, you're a Christian, but like, you can do it a little bit differently. You don't have to, like, you know, throw it in people's faces all the time. How do we go about kind of, like, telling them to chill out? <laughs> Just say something like Virgil always says to me, you know. i rather, you know, see your life than hear you talk about your life. Mm -hmm. Just Just let your light shine, like Jesus said. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And you just say, you know, there's, there's a more impactful way to demonstrate you coming under the authority of God's word yep. to show it in your life. Yeah. That's good. And there's also a time to speak up, yeah. you know, and say God says. But there's a, there's a wholesome balance in life that God gives us. Good to know, good to know. Um, and then you also talked about in step three how um, you were bummed that you missed, you uh, lost a few pages, and but you have to come back and kind of remember like what, no matter what, you know, all your confidence has to be in the Lord and that sometimes it's your first thought to kind of like go back to what you know and what you've learned and stuff like that. So how do we kind of change that default of like going back to what we know? <laughs> Let me drink a little water on this question because uh, okay. the reason this is my life scripture is because I know my weaknesses and I know that I like to be in control. I know <laughs> that I like to see things go a certain way and so... Uh, when I lost those pages, I was like, this is not supposed to happen to me. You know, I'm organized. I, I have stuff yeah. saved. I have backups. This should not have, I don't even remember losing it. I was kind of sleepy on a Zoom call, you know. I'm not supposed to fall asleep on Zoom calls, but I was a little sleepy. I zoned out. I took my, my face off the video, and I was just taking a break on the Zoom call. I'm just Zoomed out. But anyway, and so I think... <laughs> I think it, <laughs> I think it happened during that time. Oh wow! And then I I woke up and I was alert again, and there was no research, yeah. and so, um, I God was not mad at me that I was bummed out for a couple hours and I was kind of down. You know, I I didn't have the same fervor in writing. I just stopped writing and. I just started chilling, you know. Um, and so he patient. He was patient with me and helped me change my narrative. He helped me change that in my own life by saying, mm. Brian, you remember, 
uh, remember my word, right? Uh, you know, this is your life scripture, and you need to trust me. I want you to go in a different direction with this sermon. Gotcha. What you have is okay, but I have something else. Okay. And that settled me down, and I was able to sit down and start writing again and hear from the Lord. Gotcha. But it, it's a conversation with God. It's a struggle. It's not easy. You're not always going to do it right. Um, it took, I think it took me about three hours to recover. <laughs> so, so it's not always, you're not always going to be yeah. on, on top of it. You are going to fail, and, and, but God is right there with you with his mercy and his grace to help you get back on track. God changed the default. Got Talk it. to God, he will change the default. <laughs> okay, got it. Um, and then our last question um, is that you kind of were talking about how, like, people sometimes can ask negative questions and it can kind of seem like they're attacking what you believe and kind of what you feel deeply. So sometimes it's kind of hard to even, like, listen and get through people's entire questions. So how do we kind of get through those questions and make it so that we don't leave the conversation with more attention. Very good. God has shown me that I need to hear the heart of that person because that person needs ministry. If that's really what that person believes, if now they could be talking about some of the challenges that Christianity poses yeah. because Christians, some Christians are misguided and do stuff like slavery. They could be having an honest conversation about that. And so you, you try to understand their world from that perspective. But, but they, there are others who are asking these questions. They really believe that the church is irrelevant and the church has done a lot of damage. Um, they really believe that the Bible is archaic and draconian and, and does more damage than good. They yeah. really believe that. And so... God has shown me to really listen to their heart, hear them, and see where he can use me to encourage that person and to demonstrate what a real Christian looks like. Yeah. What does Jesus look like in the life of the person sitting right in front of you while you're insulting what I believe, you're insulting the church, you're being biased, you won't listen you don't see anything good when there is plenty of evidence for good. God is showing me nowadays, let them see Jesus in you. Hmm. And, and walk patiently walk with them uh, through their challenges with Christianity and Christ. Gotcha. Thank you. And thank you for joining us and asking all, answering all my questions. Um, and if you all have more questions that I didn't cover in postscripts, you can leave them in the comments below. And hope you have a great day. Mm -hmm.